Hello, and welcome to episode number 75 of the Point of Convergence podcast. As always, I am your host, Exoacadamian. Many of the people who regularly tune in to this podcast know that the UFO phenomenon, general paranormality, and other so-called contact modalities such as NDEs, OBEs, and psi phenomena are addictively fascinating matters. One could draw the conclusion that this is the case simply because the nature of the subject matter is seductive and helps to distract people from the mundanity of their everyday existence. While the subject matter does indeed draw one deeper and deeper into the proverbial rabbit hole the longer one pays attention with a keen, discerning eye, I think there's more than meets the eye going on here. I think partly what's going on is a kind of remembering the future. What I mean by that is that our collective fascination with this subject matter reflects a kind of mental bookmark to what becomes a key inflection point in our civilization's history. You could describe it as the experience of living through the arising of an interference pattern where the present is equally impacted by events from our past and our future. Particularly significant points in time can tend to feel like this, even if it is confusing to those living through it. Particularly thoughtful researchers like the preeminent Jacques Vallée have noted that what we are seeing take place with the modern UFO phenomenon is simply the latest wrinkle in time of a larger phenomenon that has been manifesting since time immemorial. Here I speak of the interaction between human beings and other sophisticated, bewitching, non-human intelligences, intelligences so capable both in matters of the external and internal sciences manifesting in both the world and the mind, that they have undoubtedly played a key role in shaping the very meaning models that we currently shape our collective existence with and through. Former rock star and later founder of TTSA, Tom DeLong, ended up uttering what I have found in retrospect to be apt words in describing the nature and origin of many of the others of which we speak. In one interview, DeLong said, quote, The evidence doesn't suggest it's interplanetary, so people need to understand religion, ancient texts, the occult, esoteric stuff. They need to understand that time is not linear, it's parallel. And once you understand that all things, past, present, future, exist at one moment, which is what quantum mechanics is kind of figuring out, then they'll realize that there can be parallel realities right here, with advanced civilizations that are popping over with frequency, not linear not coming from Alpha Centauri here, and I'm not suggesting that can't happen too, but what is happening here is a little bit different, unquote. Indeed it is, and I would add to this insightful analysis that I at first didn't pay close enough attention to when I began this journey years ago, that it's not that some of them are not extraterrestrial, in some very real ways some groups are, but importantly, that's only part of the story. They are also interdimensional, but in a way that diverges from some of the ways that term has conventionally been used by astrophysicists in terms of a multiverse, and is more in line with the way the term is applied, as DeLong hints at, by enthusiasts of the occult and other forms of esotericism. Notice there that I said groups, plural, and I stand by this. I am more convinced than ever that the evidence suggests more than one group is involved, and that these groups cover the gamut in terms of their developmental consciousness. I speak in terms of degrees of evolution of consciousness because I have found this is both a more helpful and a more accurate way of describing the situation than by painting in polarities of black and white absolutes, i.e. good versus evil. Now, while DeLong has seemed particularly concerned with the ways some of the less mature groups have been working their will in our collective lives, I personally have experienced what it's like to be in contact with and be inspired by groups who are typical of the more evolved, highly conscious end of the spectrum. And it's a discussion of that particular interaction and the way that it's impacted my ongoing journey that is the topic of this, the 75th edition of the Point of Convergence podcast. I'd like to begin this week's podcast by saying... Over the last several weeks, numerous people have reached out to say they've noticed a shift in my treatment of this topic since when the podcast first began, almost two years ago now. 
These individuals have said they've enjoyed the new trajectory of the podcast, but are now very curious about what precipitated this change. In other words, people have been asking me to outline my path and process in evolving from a show that presented various speculative threads to do with the UFO phenomenon and general paranormality to one that has become laser focused on a particular approach to this subject matter, which includes not just UFOs and aliens and high strangeness, but also psi phenomena, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, basically all of the so-called contact modalities. This is certainly a fair and accurate statement. I myself recognize this shift, and to be sure, the shift has come about to a large degree as a result of my own personal experiences. It's been quite a journey, one that, from one frame of reference, stretches out over the past six months or so, in terms of really hitting a breakneck pace of revelation and clarity, but that, from another frame of reference, is about a recontextualization of my entire lifetime. In other words, the further I tread on this new path, the more and more the terrain of decades past becomes reclaimed by this new overarching perspective. Yes, no small statement there. It would not be a stretch to say that, in a very real way, I feel like I'm stepping out the actions of a script that has been preordained. That said, I think this is as much because time is not what we generally think it is, in terms of the conventional linear view, rather than because some overarching force has predestined my actions. In other words, the part of me that stumbles into this feeling of familiarity, akin to what I like to call remembering the future, is also synergistically connected with a part of me that exists outside of time altogether. And of course, I realize that is no small statement either. Okay, enough with that preamble. Let me get to what people have been asking for a description of the process that has led me to this shift in perspective and approach. Now, as some of you have already guessed, much of this shift first began to take root around the time I took part in a private retreat at the Monroe Institute, titled UFOs and the Consciousness Connection. The event was also attended by people known to the public, including prime experiencer Chris Bledsoe, my friend and research colleague Sean Esborn Hargens, and long-term UFO researcher, both from within and from outside of government, Colonel John Alexander, amongst several others. For those of you eager to learn more about that, I discussed some of my experiences on that retreat in episode 67, titled Human Initiated Contact on Proactive Communication with Non-Human Intelligence. I was also interviewed by James Iandoli for his Engaging the Phenomenon channel about the event and some of my experiences there as well. At this retreat, we not only engaged in CE5, or HICE, Human Initiated Contact Events, but we also took part in various practices to grow our psi and astral capabilities, including the use of some Monroe Institute auditory programs that were custom-crafted for the event. I also want to add here that while my experience at the Monroe event was transformative, experiences earlier in the year were precursors to this, and I think these were just as essential. Sometimes we make note of a key turning point, like when a plant first arises from the ground. But of course, the root work is underway long before then. To this point, I actually made contact with some kind of external intelligence during a period of meditation around the year 2010. And it was then that I was inspired to follow a new kind of protocol for receiving information. And I've been following that protocol ever since. That said, the sheer volume of information received in short periods of time greatly increased over the last year. Realizations around the non-dual nature of reality, communicated to me via Vedantic and Buddhist traditions around that time, 2010 or so, also served as a key seeding of the soil, if you will, for these later experiences over the last year or so. Now, several things happened in the period just prior to Monroe, including a couple of months closely spent with someone else on the experiencer track. And I know these experiences were key ingredients in preparing for what was to come later and what was to come to fruition. But getting back to the Monroe retreat, the long and the short of it is that we did indeed have several encounters with anomalous phenomena over the course of the several days of that retreat. Now, to be sure, seeing those phenomena in the night skies above the Monroe Institute was certainly a profound experience for me. 
one that seemingly helped to initiate a new path. That said, I would have to say that what has come about since then is even more profound to me personally, and I'll explain why shortly. But generally speaking, while seeking anomalous lights or objects in the sky, representing the handiwork of sophisticated non-human intelligence is certainly amazing. It really doesn't compare to the experience of direct communication with said intelligences. And what I found is that one need not see phenomena in the sky for the communication to flow, even if that is indeed sometimes part of the initial priming. Not long after my experience at the Monroe Institute, I had another, perhaps even more profound, CE5 slash Heist experience when I was with Chris Bledsoe at his home, and that really rooted in my mind the notion that these others really are an ongoing part of our reality, just as real as apple pie and taxes to those who've experienced them. Now, many people have heard about the so-called hitchhiker effect. This is a phrase coined to describe some of the bizarre ways people who experience the phenomenon subsequently become tied to these other intelligences and or phenomena. In other words, they, whoever or whatever they are, quote unquote, follow you home, manifesting in strange ways in the days, weeks, months, and sometimes even years following the original initiation or contagion event. Of course, most often we hear about these incidents in a negative frame, when people encounter unwanted after effects such as poltergeist phenomena. Such experiences were depicted in a recent book by George Knapp, Colm Kelleher, and James Lekatsky titled Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. That book outlined shocking events and after effects for people who'd spent time at the so called Skinwalker Ranch of the Uinta Basin in Utah. As alarming as some of those encounters are, it's important to note as has been the case in my experience, this can also manifest as a positive phenomenon as well. In other words, one can become hitched to intelligences or phenomena of a decidedly positive nature as well. What happens on these occasions is a matter of some debate. From my own perspective, I would say this has more to do with a dormant part of my consciousness being brought online as it has to do with beings following me around, quote unquote. With the ones I've been connected to, space-time is largely irrelevant. So it's not so much that they follow you, as that you now have an open channel for communication and interaction. This channel can serve as a means for telepathic communication, and it can even be a channel for telekinetic activity, where physical effects in one space are observed. Regardless of how you frame it, the end result has been, in my case anyway, that those catalytic hitching events opened up the possibility of an ongoing relationship with this otherworldly intelligence. You could call it a kind of cosmic entanglement. It's also important to note here that it was right around this time that I decided to step out from behind the shadows to become more public, in terms of revealing my name and appearing for the first time in video interviews and such. I would say that this decision to step fully forward into what you might call the headwinds of this has been key in taking the communication experiences to the next level. It's as if these others were waiting for me to take such a step. In fact, something very much to that effect has been communicated to me. And when I say I was told this, I of course mean telepathically. That said, direct, linear, one idea following another kind of communication doesn't fully capture my experience over the last several months, and I'll touch on that next. Now, in my interview with James for the Engaging the Phenomenon podcast, I mentioned that soon after my experience at the Monroe Retreat, I began to experience what has come to be referred to by experiencers and the researchers who investigate them as downloads. For me, this often has meant waking up with new fragments of information in my mind. And I say fragments because often these packets of information don't seem to make a lot of sense initially. However, what often transpires is later on, something happens, a synchronistic anchoring event of some kind or another, and this packet of information drops into place, almost like a puzzle piece, and I suddenly understand what it means and how it's connected to other information in my mind. Now, the dropping in of fragments of larger data sets is only one way in which this communication takes place. 
Another form arises when I am led to follow a certain line of thinking or investigative path. Sometimes this comes in the form of a strong hint that I should speak with one particular person or another, even people who live on the other side of the planet. Other times a certain book or resource will come into my awareness and I'll have that same energetic impulse arise, which I've come to understand means, pursue this, there is valuable information here. Now, speaking of this energetic impulse, if you were to ask me, as some people have, what does this feel like and how do you distinguish it from your personal imagination or inklings, I would say that it's the nature of the impulse that really is key. It has a distinct feel to it. For people who've experienced clairvoyance, they will know that when information comes in that is extrasensory in nature, it also has a certain distinct feel to it. It's something like that like an energetic signature that is unique. This requires a kind of subtle sensing that I've also been encouraged, shall we say, to continue to develop. The more one has developed this subtle sensing, the more one can identify the nature of the information coming in, including its origin source, and the more one can ascertain the intentions of various entities one might meet out on the interdimensional highways. That being the case, I'm sure you can understand why having an advanced ability in subtle sensing is key. Walking blind into the waking world is a tough task. That challenge also extends into the astral or etheric realms as well. And on that note, you may have heard various people associated with the UFO phenomenon suggest CE5, or heist, is dangerous because you just don't know who's going to pick up on the other end. I think this is a misstating of the nature of the endeavor. After all, a key reason why experiencers have been told to meditate beforehand is because setting intention and being self-aware about your own energetic state and or resonance is a key step in determining what number, so to speak, one ends up calling when reaching out via a protocol like CE5 or HICE. And I think this is why the data suggests that the vast, vast majority of experiences with CE5 or HICE protocols are positive. Now, speaking of meditation, for me this has become a major source of contact and information relay with these particular others. I have found that I don't need to go outside in order to facilitate this. In fact, very often this only becomes a distraction for me if I get too focused on the spectacle of seeing something in the sky. For me, I have found that the connection is there regardless of where one is, so going to one place or another just isn't important. What's more important is that one has a quiet, non-distracting place to meditate in. When I engage in this kind of meditation, which is like other forms of meditation except that I hold open an intention to these others, various things can occur. Sometimes I'll receive a vision, often very vivid, that just pops into my mind. Often this experience is less about information relay and more about a sign that my non-local mind has moved, so to speak. Other times I will hold open a question while meditating and I'll either receive a sense of the answer almost immediately or that question will hang out like a cosmic request to a non-local server, if you will, and the question gets answered at some later time when one of those synchronistic anchoring events takes place. And again, when the latter happens, I'll sense that energetic signature that makes it clear that this is one of those kinds of experiences. It's like a strong sense of synchronicity. On more rare occasions, I'll experience an unusual degree of sudden fatigue, which I have come to recognize is a sign that a particularly dense kind of download has arrived, meaning there is a lot of information there, or that it's particularly karmically impacting in some way. I think the feeling of overwhelming fatigue has to do with the fact that the body-mind of this 3D manifestation has a hard time knowing how to hold or express that information in our space-time construct. On even more rare occasions, this has happened probably four or five times over the last year, I'll feel intense waves of emotion pulsing through and over me, like I'm surfing an ocean of pure energy. On these occasions, I don't really even experience having a body. I am just in a timeless, spaceless state, undifferentiated, being overrun by these meaning waves. 
I sense these are the formless waves of cosmic consciousness that give rise to our mostly illusory physical reality. You can think about them like the source code for our daily waking experience. I cannot overstate how intense these waves are. On more than one occasion, I've told close friends that during the experience, it feels often like I'm going to die. Of course, I've come to recognize that I don't die from these experiences, and so this has led me to just letting go, letting whatever work is being done continue. And that's exactly what it feels like, that work is being done on an energetic level. Now, part of the reason why I describe it that way is because after the fact, in the days following these experiences, I will feel a new vitality to my beingness as a result of a deep clearing and or cleansing. I've described it to some people as something akin to experiencing 10 years of therapy in the course of a couple of hours. That energetic tsunami has served to effectively wipe clean the false construction of self that my intellect built up over years as a kind of defense mechanism against a harsh world, which, let's be honest, this one can be that way. While I may have needed these defense mechanisms in decades past, I no longer do. They no longer serve me, and they actually have become more of a hindrance than a help in my present reality. And in these experiences, I sense that some greater intelligence knows me better than I know myself, and it facilitates this kind of energetic tsunami so as to free up my resources for future work. One other piece I will add here is that on some occasions, when I'm experiencing this other modality, I feel as if my identity is decidedly different. I effectively feel like I'm experiencing a part of myself that exists elsewhere, like a simultaneously running other self. And I really need to say self in quotes there, because actually, in these moments, I feel like my identity is part of a plurality of beings that have become a single planetary kind of consciousness that vibrates in powerful harmony. I will also add that in this modality, Time itself doesn't experientially exist for me. Not surprisingly, when I return to my usual waking state in our familiar 3D world, it can be a bit off-putting, because then I suddenly have an experiential contrast that exposes just how constricting our linear experience of reality here really is. That said, there is also this knowing that I am here precisely because of that resistance because it is hard to live here, because it is that resistance that helps us to grow. Now, not surprisingly, when I look back at all of this, I would say that it has changed me in some pretty profound ways. In terms of how it has impacted my work as a researcher of the UFO phenomenon and consciousness itself, I would describe the transition as going from being someone deeply fascinated with the mystery of the phenomenon, and here I mean all of the contact modalities, not just UFOs and aliens, to someone who feels committed to a sense of mission, a mission that was in very real ways laid out before I ever incarnated into this particular body-mind. And here I'd like to bring this full circle to where I began this conversation talking about how experiences over the last year have effectively reclaimed more and more terrain of my lifetime. At this point, my entire life feels recontextualized. I feel something akin to a sleeper agent who has awoken to a sense of purpose, a purpose that was always lurking in the background, but now feels to have crystallized into something clear and actionable. I could go on, but I've already said a lot and perhaps the best is left for future podcast episodes. To say that I now feel like I'm in possession of or have access to a wealth of cosmological information is perhaps the understatement of the century. I will say that everything I've come across in terms of this new cosmology has a place for various elements of the UFO phenomenon, and that includes experiences that are positive, some that are neutral, some that are negative, or at least perceived that way. Again, we have here a plurality of different beings, indeed different groups. Some are more evolved than others. Some are still very in self-service, and others are more universal in their mind. And the more universal ones are very interested in our progress as younger siblings, if you will. 
The less mature ones are still motivated by selfish desires, much like many of us are and many of our leaders are on this planet. Now, recently on social media, I've been summarizing some of these revelations I've had by publishing what I'm calling New Cosmology Truths. These are little tidbits of information that I feel have been communicated to me that help me make sense of what's going on in the larger sense of the picture. And I'd like to share some of those now. I've got eight of them that I want to pass on to you. Number one, psychic attacks from non-human intelligence happen. Biblical texts reference slash translate these in terms of powers and principalities. Importantly, we're talking about a category of being that collapses and transcends both aliens and demons. And that's key. Spirituality, religious history, and the UFO phenomenon are all captured within this cosmology. It's all part of the same thing. And again, non-duality is key to understanding all of this. All right, moving on to the next cosmological tidbit. Telepathy is the default mode of communication throughout the interdimensional cosmos because all beings are ultimately facets of the one undivided source of consciousness. Thus, telepathy is effectively knowing one's mind. And I would point out here that cutting-edge neuroscience and physics is kind of pointing in this direction anyway. Telepathy works not because there's a signal sent between two different beings, but because ultimately those beings are one being, that they are, in the deepest sense, one source, and that one source has access to all. And of course, that explains why many of these others, these alien beings, know everything about us. They know about every facet of our lives. Again, because if you want to call it the Akashic Records or whatever, that basically refers to the fact that at the source level, there are no secrets. All right, on to number three. To see reality in terms of distinct physical and spiritual realms is another form of duality. Reality is one. A physical manifestation is the activity of consciousness. A whirlpool presents as a distinct something but is ultimately just water in activity. Number four, in the same way that emergent capacities come online as part of the process of evolution, at various points this emergence fundamentally changes one's interaction with the environment, creating a mind over matter scenario as evidenced in the powers of various non-human intelligences. Number five, Plumbing the depths of the unconscious is a path back to the all. In these depths, the mountaintop manifestations that appear as, and are being experienced as, individual selves, merge back into undivided bedrock that is their true source. Number six, in terms of overarching dynamics, non-duality is key. Because once non-duality has been grasped as fundamental reality on a collective scale, groups affected, human and non-human, naturally expand their scope of concern to all sentient life in the cosmos. Number seven, disclosure complexity involves reckoning with the reality that Earth humans have different constitutional backgrounds, backgrounds where Earth-based human ancestral lines are only part of the story. These various types experience reality differently. Now, this was controversial when I tweeted this. People thought perhaps I was referring to eugenics. I'm not. I'm just saying we have different constitutional backgrounds. Some of the people on the earth today don't only have histories as earth humans. That's part of the complexity, and that's partly why we have such a mess of a consciousness situation, because there are people at very different levels presently coexisting on the earth. And finally, number eight, in imagining exploring the edges of the physical universe, we fail to recognize that everything discoverable there is readily available via journeys within. Ultimately, outward and inward journeys take us to the same place, quote unquote, outside of space-time altogether. Now, in closing, what I will say of all this new information, however, is that it all wondrously fits with other elements of truth that I had already integrated into my being before any of this year's experiences took place. In other words, this contact has also served as a thread that's pulled together previously disparate elements of my life, 
spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, making the entire enterprise feel both directed and overarchingly purposeful. Importantly, I would add that I believe this is true for each and every one of us. None of these experiences makes me special. These kinds of contact potentialities are part of our birthright as facets of the one cosmic intelligence that undergirds absolutely everything that is on every plane and every stage of consciousness. Despite what the absurd message of the reductionistic materialist worldview would have you believe, you are here for a reason, and you also have a mission in the form of an energetic waveform that wants to resolve itself, if you will. This purpose also extends to us as a collective. We as a civilization, expressed in numerous present grades of progress, also form unique iterations of consciousness. And those various grades are also seeking, even when not fully aware of it, to move towards clarity, resolution, and eventually, graduation. I am as convinced of this as I am that tomorrow morning, come rain or shine, the sun will make its way over the horizon of our 3D collective mindscape. And on that note, we've come to the close of another edition of the Point of Convergence podcast. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash exoacadamian. But until next time, friends, from deep within the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina, this is Exoacadamian, signing out.